Drago mi je veoma da smo se večeras okupili i broj ljudi koji je došao govori i koliko je važna tema, a govori i o autoru. Danas smo ovde da predstavimo knjigu Anarchy and the Kingdom of God from Eschatology to Orton's Political Theology and Back. Davora Džalta, profesora Univerzitetskog koleđa u Sokolu, umetnika, društvenog teoretičara, religiologa i verovatno smo još nešto važno zaboravila. Izdavač knjige je Fordham University Press. Danas su se nama online ili offline profesor Univerzitete Fordham u New Yorku, Aristotel Pavlo Nikolao, inače urednik edici ovog projekta ide izdata, pravo se ne sada ne razmisao, profesor Elidije Eric Gregori iz Univerziteta Princeton, i profesor filozofije, sociologije, pa na filozofije Univerziteta Univerziteta u Beogradu, Jovo Bakić, i ja vam želim da vam želim. S ovim na goste, bilo bi zaista nekritično da ja ovde kidnapujem i zaupotrebljavam govornicu, tako da ću prvo zamoliti prizutno da nešto kažem u knjizi. Potom će, verujem, ostati i vremena da se razvije razgovor izveću govornika, ali da pođe i na pitanje slike. Za početak, da ne reći s ovom svom pametom glavu. I can't I can't hear you, Davor. Can't hear you. You can start. Oh, you want me to start? Yeah. Um, just sort of launch into my discussion of the book. You ready for that? You're you're the first to speak. I'm the first to speak. Okay. Hello everybody. <laughs> Uh, very good to be here, um, uh, to be part of this panel. Um, I guess the first thing I want to say <laughs> is I have the book here, uh, a wonderful uh, book by uh, someone I consider a colleague, a friend, of course, um, and I'm not saying it's a wonderful book simply because he's a friend. I think the first thing I want to point out is I want to speak a little bit about the orthodox scene, the orthodox political theology scene. And I think the first thing that I want to say is to kind of indicate that how good it is for this book to be out because it's part of a series of uh, writings, books, uh, blogs on political theology, on orthodox political theology. And one of the reasons why this is good is because I think there can be a kind of caricature, kind of hardened view of what Orthodox Christianity is about, not simply from uh, those who are not Orthodox, but from within the Orthodox world. And in fact, I'll, I'll, I'm going to quote two Serbian professors from 1997 to indicate this caricature, this kind of hardened view. So. One of the things to first kind of point out, and Davor does this in his book, is that there's a diversity. There's a diversity within orthodoxy, within orthodox Christianity. There can be alternative narratives. There can be alternative ways of trying to understand the tradition. How we see the churches acting today, or even certain orthodox Christians, or even what we saw in history, is not uh, the only way. And I think Davor's book, simply uh, by being published and offering what he uh, offers, but also the arguments he offers, the, the research he's done, the patristic text he cites shows that there can be different ways of thinking about an Orthodox Christian response uh, to the political realm, to, he calls it the political societal uh, seer the political societal fear. So there can be different uh, theological kinds of ways of thinking about that, that relationship. So that's the first thing I want to say. Diversity. There is diversity within Orthodox. There can be diversity. Davor's book uh, gives witness to that, to a different way of thinking about it. And I think it's very, very important, not simply for uh, non-Orthodox, but for people within the church, 
clerics, bishops, theological professors. It's also important for those in the academic world, uh, both in the United States and in Serbia, especially those on the academic left, to understand that um, maybe there are different ways of thinking about it. And I think Dabur's book is worth reading uh, only to kind of see that there can be different ways of thinking about it. Second, <clears throat> I want to indicate, and this is probably well known to everybody already, but it's worth repeating that this uh, kind of um, explosion, one could say, of political theologies um, in the Orthodox world. And, and there, uh, if I may, they are represented. I mean, I've written a book on this. Other people are writing essays. But there's this book, uh, Political Theologies in Orthodox Christianity, um, which has several uh, essays. And Davor has an essay in here. But this also gives witness and, of course, um, uh, there, there's an essay, uh, there are many, many essays in here from people from all over uh, the Orthodox world, from Russia, uh, from Greece, of course, um, uh, from, from the United States. Um, and of course, Bogdan Lubertich has an article in here on uh, the thought of Justin Popovich. But just to indicate that this explosion has something to do with being in a post-communist situation. And this post-communist situation, uh, it now is about 30 years old, which really isn't a long time. And it is the first time that I, I like to say that the Orthodox are trying to figure out how to learn without, how to, how to live without emperors, how to live without uh, dictators. Um, now, whether they've succeeded in learning to live without dictators is another story, and maybe we can discuss this in the general discussion, because what we see, obviously, in many parts of the Orthodox world is a return towards some form of autocracy, some form of totalitarianism, some form of pseudo-democracy under a one-party system. Uh, and we're also seeing the church ultimately playing a role in supporting those particular kinds of regimes. So one of the uh, questions really is, uh, again, this post-communist situation, and the post-communist situation created this discussion, th this question about orthodoxy and democracy. And in one of the first essays I wrote about this, I, in fact, quote at the very beginning of the essay, two Serbian intellectuals, Mila Danzivotic, who was a former pro uh, philosophy professor. So he wrote this in 1997. He said, the church's ideology is common to that of all authoritarian ideologies. It was because of the Orthodox Church that this society was easily convinced that it had to become obedient followers of the Communist Party. And then there's another professor, Mirko Georgievich, who at the time was a retired literature professor in 1997. And he said the Roman Catholic Church announced in the Second Vatican Council that it was the duty of believers to support democracy and human rights. But the church in the East has never addressed these issues and found itself unprepared with the fall of communism. So there's a kind of uh, implication here somehow that the church uh, at the ver is either incompatible or was unprepared. And to some extent, the church for the first time, the Orthodox world was negotiating a theological reflecting on democratic structures. Uh, I think there are two things to keep in mind now in this. First is that in negotiating these democratic structures, I think it also was negotiating its stance towards what we're calling the secular. But the church usually had a one a somewhat homogeneous understanding of what the secular entailed as a kind of aggressive elimination of religion. In its reflections on the secular, what we see coming from church statements, especially, is uh, we, what we don't see is a more nuanced view that part of what the secular is, is an idea, an idea, a kind of pragmatic attempt to how to arrange things politically in such a way that uh, there can be a kind of um, promotion and support of pluralism within society. And it's clear that the Orthodox churches over the past 30 years, one of the 
uh, one of the things they've had a problem with is this kind of pluralism, uh, maybe from an ethnic point of view, from a religious point of view, but even from a moral point of view. So one of the questions really becomes is, uh, to what degree, I mean, there is not a single Orthodox church in the world that has condemned democracy, not a single one. But given their actions, uh, given their uh, the way in which they have related to various state structures, given the current relationships between various Orthodox churches and particular state structures, I guess one of the questions we need to ask is how much the church really, the institutional church, has contributed to the flourishing of democratic structures within the post-communist countries. But the third thing I want to say, and I'll end here, is just simply to say again, and to reiterate, this somewhat comes back to my first point, to see whether there can be a kind of theological reflection, to see whether there can be a kind of theological reflection which ultimately can, can point to different ways in which the church can uh, relate to the political sphere, whether there can be different ways in which the church can actually uh, promote uh, various forms of pluralism which are constitutive of democratic societies, whether there's language, ideas um, uh, that can help us to think about that. And, and that's what Davor's book does provide. It provides that book. And I think he provides it, obvi obviously he provides it uh, uh, in the form of what he calls a kind of Christian anarchism. And let me just point here that uh, my own approach was to promote a kind of Christian liberalism. And I, I just want to touch on this particular point here in particular, because I think in the end, um, Davor and I uh, uh, agree on many things. We might be using different words, but I think we agree on the basic approach and the end result. Um, I chose the word liberalism because liberalism was being attacked both within Christian theological uh, discourse, but even in non-Christian theological discourse. Liberalism also sometimes is used by church rhetoric as a kind of ungodly, anti-religious, hyper-individualistic uh, form of thinking about the self and societal relations. Um, and I guess my biggest fear was that the critique of liberalism would ultimately be leveraged by those within the church as a way of justifying certain kinds of church-state relations um, that, that ultimately privilege the church within society, which I think has happened actually. So in my own uh, defense of a kind of Christian liberalism or perhaps a Christian theological defense of various basic liberal principles, I think I also tried to show that there can be different ways of thinking of what liberalism entails. Um, it can entail forms of relationality that the orthodox notion of personhood supports. Um, it, can, it, can, uh, it can lead to imagining forms of community that where there is a common good, and there are patterns of relationship that are analogous to, but not exactly alike, Eucharistic community. So I, I, I use that word, and Dauber uses the word anarchy or anarchism. Uh, but in the end, I don't, I don't think we're, I think we're, we're pretty much on the same page. I think that what we're both looking for are uh, affirming basic principles that organize political community that somehow are grounded in orthodox theological principles um, that uh, ultimately affirm that whatever the political kingdom is, it's not, can never be the kingdom of God, that there always has to be a prophetic or critical element or critical stance. Uh, on all these things, I think we agree. I think we're, the one point where we might disagree is that he 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 does say that he does he's a, he does say that he's not anti-statist, right? He, so he does say that in his book. But I think I'm more willing to point to institutional structures that must be necessary for this kind of community, uh, whereas he is not. And so, for example, just a 
basic example, but he might agree with this, I don't know, but one institutional structure of a functioning democracy, and this is really very relevant both to Serbia and to the United States, is the transfer of power. It's very difficult to imagine a democratic, a sustainable to democratic society without the transfer of power, without the peaceable transfer of power. And that, that's, that's, not a, that's not a principle, that's an institutional structure. And so I, I think, and I could say more, I mean, I'm very much influenced by a, a, a recent book um, by uh, Cecile Laborde, um, Liberalism's Religion. And maybe, yeah, I think that's what it's called. I usually forget titles, but liberalism is religion. And there you see, I think, a, a very sustained, rigorous argument for the kinds of structures and ways of thinking about religion, of course, within liberalism um, that ultimately are needed for sustaining, um, I think, the, the end goals that both Dauber and I agree on. So I think that might be just a, a minor subtle difference between the two of us in the sense that I think I think the church and theology has to be minimum, at least somewhat more explicit, uh, somewhat more explicit into the times of structure that perhaps are necessary for realizing the kinds of goals that Davor and I are ultimately seeking. So that's it for me. I just wanted to give that sense of the orthodox world where we're at today, um, some, uh, some comment on uh, perhaps uh, uh, similarities and difference between my position and Davor's. And uh, but there's more to say, and I'm hoping to do that uh, through the discussion and the conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Professor, and thank you for opening very interesting and very important questions. I'm sure that we will have interesting time debating it. Sadly, we have now a professor Bakichu. Dobro, da probamo. Dobro. Da li se čujemo? Prvo bih se zahvalio na pozivu da govorim. Na izgled za one koji me znaju neobičnu temu. Naime, o crkvi ja uglavnom nemam dobre reči. I ovo je verovatno prvi put da sa jednim kolegom kojega već poznajem dugo, a koji je pravoslavni teolog, mogu da se uveliko saglasi. Čuda se dešavlja. Dakle, miracles. I sad, o čemu je reč? Reč je o tome što obojica imamo simpatije za anarhizam. Namerno ne kažem da smo anarhisti nego da imamo značajne simpatije za anarhizam, samo što je kolega Džalto duboko religiozan čovjek. A ja sam agnostik. Ne pripadam ni jednoj crkvi. Istovremeno, od rane mladosti su me zanimala religijska pitanja. I razume se, pročitao sam i stari i novi zavet, razmišljao o njima, što bi rekli hrišćani, borio se sa sobom i sa svojom savešću i odlučio na tragu Kanta da su moj razum i moja čula nedovoljno jaki, da spoznam da li Boga ima ili nema, pa se time neću baviti. Svejedno, nisam do kraja ravno došao. I u tom smislu, pošto je i profesor Papa Nikolau 
završio svoje izlaganje nekim pitanjima, ja ću možda započeti nekim pitanjima. Otkud čoveku takva gordost da pomisli da je Bog stvorio svet i njega, naročito njega, takvog kakav je u svom obliču. To je već po sebi pobuna protiv Boga, ako pomislite da ste stvoreni po njegovom obliču. Ako smo mi u istinu ikone Božnje, kao što pravoslavlje misli da jesmo, dakle svako od nas, i kolega Džalto kaže, u svom neprijatelju gledajte ikonu Božiju. Ako ga kao takvog vidite, vi ćete u njemu videti sebe i vidjet ćete nešto iznad obojice ili oboje ili obe. Otkud takva gordost, naročito u hrišćanstvu? Hrišćanstvo bi trebalo da bude protiv gordosti, a ovde čovek kaže, pa da, sin Boži je baš rešio da kao čovek se iđe na zemlju, da se ovaploti i da spasi čoveka. A zapravo čovek je bačen u svet. I uprko s tome, što pretpostavljam da većina vas ovde zna da sebe smatram levičar. Levica po pravilu je antropološki optimistična. To znači da se čovek da usavršavati, da on može da napreduje, da se ljudsko društvo može usavršiti. A kakva je istorija? Sam autor ove knjige kaže da istorija uopšte ne odgovara carstvu Božije. Carstvo Božije je suprotnost istoriji, jer je cela istorija svedočanstvo o padu čoveka. Adam i Eva su kušali plod sa drva saznanja i pali. Davor kaže, da, ali to je prvi vid slobode čoveka. Pobunio se protiv Boga, napravio je glupost, ali to je sloboda, zato je pao. I zato stradamo, ali je tu nada istovremeno iz tog pada, jer ako smo slobodni bili da izaberemo loše, bit ćemo slobodni da izaberemo i dobro. I onda objašnjava autor ove knjige u liturgijskom zajedništvu je spas. Šta je liturgijsko zajedništvo? Kada se nađemo mi i vi koji verujemo u Boga zajedno i činimo, više nismo mi i vi, nego smo svi mi, činimo zajednicu ljubavi sa Bogom, što bi pokojni Atanasije Jetvić rekao, religioznost jeste mogućnost horizontalne i vertikalne komunikacije, pazite, to je krst. Dakle, horizontalno smo se mi okupili u zajednici, vertikalno uspostavljamo vezu sa gospodom, a sve na sveže ljubav. I liturgijsko zajedništvo je ljubav. Tu ostvarujemo jednakost, tu ostvarujemo slobodu i omogućava nam se, što je za Davora Džalta veoma važno, da budemo stvaralački orijentisani. Ljubav, sloboda, stvaralaštvo, to je nešto što bi trebalo da karakteriše svakoga hrišćanina. Sad, 
E kad pomislite o čemu ja govorim i o čemu je ovaj čovjek pisao. Kakve to veze ima s istorijom? Obojice ćemo vam reći nikakve. Dakle, ovo o čemu Davor Džalto piše, ja trenutno govorim, to je eskaton. To je cilj. A činjenica da ništa u istoriji ne može da podseti na taj cilj, samo govori o našoj nesavršenosti. Dobro, ali kakva je ta istorija? Istorija je svedočanstvo o padu čoveka. Drugim rečima, sama crkva, šta je ona? Pa to je hijerarhija. Institucionalizovana crkva je hijerarhijski uređena. A gde je tu liturgijska zajednica? Isus Hristos pere noge svima koji su došli. Po njegovom uzoru vladike, episkopi, treba da služe u liturgiji sve koji su stigli. Oni ih hrane Hristovim telom, Hristovom krvlju i to je evharistijsko jedinstvo u ljubavi. Međutim, šta se dešava kad se liturgija završi? Oni imaju džipove, bankovne račune, crkva je jedna od najbogatijih ustanova u društvu, Gde je tu zajednica ljubavi u Hristu? Nema je. Drugim rečima, nema veće otpadnice od hrišćanstva no što je crkva. I pravoslovna, i katolička, i tako dalje. Međutim, ovde se postavlja pitanje da li se to može prevazići I onda na scenu stupa anarhizam koji se dovodi u vezu sa ranohrišćanskim učenjima. U ranohrišćanskim učenjima jednakost je bila važna. Episkopi su bili sluge, kao što je sam Isus Hristos bio sluga. Onaj koji je poslednji bit će prvi. I onaj koji je prvi bit će posledan. Dakle, to je ta veza. Ja namerno malo pojednostavljujem. Knjiga je mnogo bogatija u svojim detaljima. Vi ćete tu imati niz imena različitih teologa. Davor Džalto je uložio izuzetan trud da nađe sve primere koji malo odstupaju od čuvene simfonije. Šta je simfonija? Dakle, saglas je duhovne i svetovne vlasti, a po tim saglasim najčešće se krije cezaropapizam, odnosno bit će onako kako vladar naredi. Međutim, Davor pokazuje u knjizi da nije moralo uvek tako biti. Da postoje primeri koji dovode u pitanje to što je opšte prihvaćeno. Pa u toliko Novgorodska republika, recimo, moram da priznam da nisam znao o njoj i sad sam saznao. Kako? Davor je zove nekom vrstom poluteokratske demokratije. Zašto? Zato što je taj neki narod, naravno, sad to je jedna ograda od onog što je Davor napisao, ne sumnjajući da je on uložio trud da sve živo iščita o tome. Uvek tu postoji mogućnost učitavanja. I pitanje je koliko je sam narod zaista birao i kneževe, i javne činovnike, kao i velikodostojnike pravoslavne crkve. Svejedno, verovatno je bar u nekim 
razdobljima trajanja Novgorodske republike, toga bilo. Dakle, vidimo jedan otklon od simfonije. Od simfonije koju treba shvatiti pod navodnicima. Jer pravoslavni teolozi, izuzimajući Davora Džalta, naši, u ovim krajevima, govorit će vam da, to je ta simfonija gde se svi lepo dogovaraju, crkva i država, sve to sjajno funkcioniše. Lepo se dogovaraju, ali zna se čije je poslednje. A to je Careva. Ovde, međutim, postoji izuzeci. Novgorodska republika ili poznatiji slučaj ikonoborstva, gde su se monasi pod Davorovim vrlo interesantnim rečima, kaže, monasi su bili prvi pankeri u istoriji. Zašto? Prvi otpadnici. Znači, kada crkva postaje zaista institucionalna sila u rimskom carstvu, u četvrtom veku, tada se javlja ovo monaštvo manastirskog tipa, dakle ne ono ispostničko monaštvo pojedinaca ličnosti, nego ovo manastirsko. Oni se u bojkot u ime otpora institucionalizaciji hrišćanstva ili hristijanizaciji istočnog rimskog carstva, poznatije pod nazivom Bizantije, povlače iz ovoga sveta. I tu se pravi taj otklon. Vi idite za bogatstvom, tragajte za moći, mi sve to odbacujemo. Ne odbacujemo samo seksualne odnose, brak i porodicu. Odbacujemo svojinu, odbacujemo sva dobra ovoga sveta, jer nam ona ništa ne znače, mi tragamo za nečim više. Vidite, ja sam se pokušao ubaciti u taj pravoslavni način razmišljanja, ovaj teorijski pravoslavni. Inače, da mene pitate, za mene to sve budi Bog znao. Ali, važno je shvatiti da protoanarhisti u pravoslovnom učenju kažu ništa što je političko nije dostojno slobodnog čovjeka. Čim uđete u politiku, vi ste rob vaših strasti, vaših interesa, vaše težnje za moći. Čim ste rob, niste slobodni. Dakle, uslov da ne budete rob jeste da ne prihvatete ozbiljno ovaj svet. I zato Davor za samog sebe kaže da je ovo on samo uslovno anarhist. Dakle, on je anarhista u tom smislu što veruje u slobodu ličnosti, u njegovo dostojanstvo, u ljubav među ličnostima, u stvaralaštvo ili stvaralački potencija koji svaka ličnost prava ima u sebi, ali isto tako kaže da u ovom svetu to nije ustvarivo. Dakle, on utoliko ne može da kaže za sebe da je anarhista, jer anarhista veruje da je u ovom svetu nešto moguće ostvariti. Davor kaže nije. Moguće je tek kad se istorija završi, kada Hristos ponovo dođe, I onda će neki ići u pakao, manjina će biti u carstvu Božije. Nažalost, ja nisam optimista. Ja mislim da čovjek nije zaslužio raj ni u kom obliči. Mislim da je istorija čovekova sudbina. Da čovjek nije zaslužio ništa više 
nego da pati kroz istoriju kao što je patio. Njemu nema spasenja, nema Boga. On mora sam sa sobom da se izbori, a neće se izboriti. Drugim rečima, Davor je mnogo veći čovjek koji ljubac od mene. On čovjeku ostavlja neku šansu. Ja ne ostavljam nijednom čovjeku pa ni sebi. Šta bi se onim na početku da je levičar antropološki optimista? Da, ja sam upravo rekao. Dakle, ja sam izuzetak. Svo moje iskustvo me uči da to nije tako. Čovjek je, nažalost, zaslužio svoju istoriju. I bojim se da ćemo i mi u narednim godinama i decenima, kad kažem mi, ne mislim samo mi, građani i građanke Srbije, nego uopšte videti još mnogo zla. I zaslužili smo da ga vidimo. Žao mi je zbog toga. Hi there, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, friends, it's good to be with you, albeit virtually. And congratulations on the publication of this important book. Let me just make three comments, each which has a question that uh, invite uh, you to expand on themes from the book. Um, the book, I think, is a significant contribution to what we might call genuinely theological political theology. It, it doesn't apply theology to politics so much as uh, turns to the political consciousness of uh, theology itself, particularly orthodox theology. So it doesn't give a general account of religion and politics, but it has a lot to say about concrete political and economic matters, uh, of which I learned a lot, especially about the Russian and Serbian context. In American universities, as um, we've heard from the previous speaker, there's been a revival of political theology, often as a kind of intellectual history, sometimes as a way to problematize um, secular or secularist politics. So one question I have picking up on uh, the many calls for a new fresh wave of orthodox political theology is why um, there, that theology has been relatively neglected or underdeveloped in the current revival of interest in political theology. Uh, in the edited volume that was referred to earlier, uh, some, of this, some of the authors claim that the reasons are internal to orthodoxy, um, that it didn't have as much dialogue with legal and constitutional theory. Um, as it did in the Latin West, um, and uh, for other political reasons. Others point to a kind of stereotype, I think, of orthodox theology as interested in spirituality and existentialism um, and eschatology and liturgy, and not about this worldly politics. So why has it been underdeveloped? And in particular, what does the Orthodox tradition offer the long tradition of Christian anarchism? And that's where I want to ask a kind of question about this book, about um, this book, which I blurbed, so I think highly of it, but um, I'm still unsure about attention. The primary claim of the book is that an anarchist approach is the only approach consistent with orthodoxy. Christian anarchism, or uh, what Davor calls Christian eschatological theocracy, challenges existing systems of power in the world and corrects the long dominant history of orthodoxy that's followed a Byzantine symphonia doctrine of harmonizing the religious and the political. 
The book claims that that view has led to political ideologies that give what he calls metaphysical significance to the political institutions of this world, at odds with the freedom and the creativity and the um, teachings of the Orthodox confession. So at times there's this radical stance. It's a bold unwillingness to attribute authority, not only to modern states, but really to any earthly power or rule of law or government of any kind. All systems of power are undone by the anarchic Eucharistic gathering of the faithful. Politics is rejected as dangerous. We shouldn't even settle for the milder form of democratic socialism, which may have just been talked about in terms of the relationship between the left and the Christian left. But the book also develops a qualified position. The problem is not government as such or politics as such. It's illegitimate government. It's oppressive government. And the book develops at the end democratic norms and practices as lesser evils that can be accepted pragmatically allowing coalitions between Christian anarchists and the democratic left. I was reminded of a Polish dissident, Adam Miknik, whose book on the church and the left in Poland called for a, a coalition based on a notion of dialogue between the secular left and a Catholic um, democratic left that was not secularist or theocratic, but brought together friends of justice and freedom in ways that I think um, Aristotle's work does. So my question is, I appreciate the consistent call for no dogmatism and what he calls the via negativia, but is the position that we can distinguish legitimate and illegitimate forms of power or is everything under judgment? Is there a fundamental opposition between orthodox faith and political power? Third, there's an analogy to what is said about the institutional church, which also on Davor's view seems always inevitably tending towards ideology. And he calls for the deprofessionalization of the church. And he says the idea of a national church is unacceptable. Now those are not difficult ideas, for a good American Protestant like myself. Though it's interesting in America right now that Christians are negotiating the tension between liberal democracy and a need for national belonging. But given the desire to offer not only an orthodox theology, but one that takes its roots in the Bible, I wonder if you could say a bit more about what the church looks like before the eschaton. It's my sense that Orthodox theology condemns nationalism as a heresy, but still wants some recognition of the value of ethnic and national identity in the context of the unity and diversity of the church. And as your book shows, there's a lot of talk about nations in the Bible. And I know in your setting, there's been a lot of talks about religion and nationalism. So how do we read the Bible? Should we desire to eliminate all ethnic and national distinctions from church life? Will you be Serbian in heaven? Or is that only a passing feature contingent of your identity? So again, I appreciate this book for correcting the caricature of orthodoxy as existentialist and not political. But also, I wonder about the kind of radical nature of the anarchism versus a more moderate distinction-making kind of anarchism that seeks coalitions, or whether it's always so distrustful of power that it doesn't seek structural revolution but only personal acts of charity and freedom and care that respect the image of God. Because that, I think, is a big tension within most 
more personalist approaches to politics. In the American context, one of my dear colleagues just passed away who was a great Orthodox thinker in America who followed the teachings of Dorothy Day, that politics is about loving your neighbor in concrete situations. But we should be wary of getting too involved in policy and structures and institutions. So as opposed to a Catholic tradition that follows someone like Jacques Maritain or others that are mentioned in this book, that seeks a kind of more structural um, institutional approach. So lots of important themes of the book. I'm not sure you, this is where we're, we're limited by Zoom and translation, but why orthodoxy has an underdeveloped political theology? Is your anarchism principled or only pragmatic? And what about the idea of a national church? Thank you very much. So now I will send a little response to that. Hvala puno. Samo da provjerim. Edit, are you still looking at TV? Yeah, good. Da li u redu ako ja na njihova pitanja odgovaram na engleskom, a na jovine pitanja i zamjerke na srpskom? Možda hoće to biti? Komentari ste jedni. Prvo bih se svima zahvalio za izvojeno vreme što ste ovde. Petak je večer, popodne, tako da nije mala žrtva izdvojiti vreme da budete ovde i da razgovaramo o ovoj knjizi. I hvala svim učesnicima i našoj divnoj moderatorki za napor koji su učinili da čitaju knjigu, da komentarišu knjigu i da vode ovo večer večeras. Let me go back first to Aristotle's questions and comments and then I think I'll address Eric's and then I'll say something about Yoga's questions and comments in Serbia. I hope that will be that will be fine with you. First of all, uh, I appreciate, first of all, thank you, Ben Telly, for uh, reading the book uh, this closely and uh, for your attempt to minimize the differences between your position and mine. Uh, I think, of course, there is a lot we agree on, but one particular point that I would like to stress is the issue of liberalism. Uh, and as you know, I think uh, that's a stumbling block uh, for, uh, in my own approach, uh, to, or, or, or at least an attempt to reconcile these two positions. You correctly uh, mentioned the issue of uh, uh, democracy and transfer of power as being uh, one of the core issues that we should focus on that actually is vital for democracy, for a well-functioning democratic society. And I think you see liberal democracy as a framework in which this happens. Just a side note that, that actually, uh, when we compare Yovo's presentation and Telly's and also Eric's, we have kind of reversed roles that Yovo as a sociologist spoke mostly about theology and religion, and we are, as theologians, are going to talk mostly about politics and, and ideologies, which I think is, is, is a good, uh, good way to proceed. Uh, so, I, I think uh, you correctly mentioned transfer of power, but the problem with liberal democracy is that there is no transfer of power. Uh, and so that's, that's, that's a problem. Take the case of the United States. You know, there is Trump, there can be Hillary, there can be whoever, Biden, but like there is no transfer of power. The overwhelming power still remains within the corporate sector that influences both political parties that are at, at this point not even political parties, but factions within one business-oriented party. So I think 
a big problem with the whole phrase liberal democracy is that uh, up to a point liberalism and democracy are conflicting in mutually exclusive terms. Uh, and my problem with liberalism is, as a modern political philosophy, is it was just very conservative. It's co been called liberal, but it's actually conservative. Uh, ideology that fits very well with business, with the corporate sector, with the accumulation of private wealth. And that's where I see anarchism as something that is much more intimately connected with uh, freedom, and not just metaphysical freedom, but freedom in political, in the political realm. Uh, so that would be uh, my comment about it. That we most of the time we are stuck with discussions whether it's liberalism or should we have liberalism or conservatism. But uh, but I think it's uh, it's a too narrow uh, scope within which uh, we have our discussions. Uh, that's not the whole world. We should seek for alternative political philosophies and political practices. And I think anarchism, in a variety of ways in which it historically has developed, uh, pretty much offers or has a potential to offer some of these solutions. Uh, now, back to Eric's important question, uh, or three questions. Uh, why is political theology underdeveloped in the Orthodox world? Well, some, sometimes it's good to, to hear uh, comments and questions uh, on your own book because then you, you realize that maybe you should read it again and, and make sure that you actually said everything you think you did. Uh, I, I think actually I, I kind of answered that question. And the answer is, it's not underdeveloped. It's been there uh, since forever. The problem is not that it's not there. The problem is the character of predominant uh, political uh, theologies. Not only within Orthodox Christianity, but anyway. Uh, and as soon as you look at the dominant character of political theologies, you are stuck with uh, predominantly narratives, theological narratives, that affirm power structures and domination and presence of various kinds. And that, that is, of course, it can be more moderate or more extreme, but uh, take a look at the predominant approach uh, in the English-speaking world to the uh, issue of power and politics from theological perspectives. Unless it's very conservative, which is a minority position nowadays, at least among the intellectual class, not popular theologists, uh, you see that we still hear the constructive theologies that are there to defend the dominant order of power. Uh, and that's the same that what the majority of theologians in Russia do vis a vis their uh, political context, which is a troubling thing when you think about it. Uh, can theology and political theology uh, function as a critical discourse? I think it can and it should, but for most of the time that's not, that's not the case of anarchism. Anarchism as a political theology which has its focus on the eschaton and kingdom of God and that kind of stuff. Uh, but then there is anarchism as a political uh, position which is skeptical in principle toward every exercise of power, pressure, and domination, and which does not necessarily prescribe particular of uh, what should we do in each context, a kind of a simplified manual that can lead us to ideal societies. I think historically this has been a great mistake, repeated over and over again, both on the right and on the left. Uh, when you come up with abstract ideas, theories, that you uh, fall in love with, and then you try to impose it no matter what, uh, will bring democracy or will bring uh, a certain kind of free society or anarchy society and, and then uh, we know uh, what an ideal society uh, should look like. I think that shouldn't be the position of an anarchist. Now, uh, Eric is right when he asks, does it mean that we then should simply uh, not offer any solutions? No. Uh, we should be offering solutions in concrete 
circumstances for concrete societies, but always be cautious about not, not to impose our own abstract concepts and ideas onto very complicated realities, because once we start doing that, we just end up in another form of oppression. And what was the third one about national, uh, national churches? Uh, so the question was whether you know, somebody from here in the kingdom of God will still be a serf. I don't know, and I, can, I don't even care. Uh, but uh, national churches, of course, are problematic if you think about uh, churches that are supposed to serve some political agendas or political entities. Uh, on the other hand, there is also something that's that we can call culture, that we bring uh, into this orthodox or Christian context, and that shouldn't be uh, prohibited, that we, that we shouldn't get rid of it. It's a very valuable thing. So, uh, does this answer your questions, Eric, or do you want to? Do you have a follow-up? Well, just maybe very quickly, I, I did understand that, I, I guess well, it'd be a bad way to say that you think orthodox political theology is underdeveloped. In some sense, you think it's overdeveloped, but only of one kind, in support of the dominant powers. Um, so maybe it's underdeveloped in the kind of more uh, alternative political theologies, and that's what you're offering us. Um, and yeah, I mean, I guess it, it, it's hard to say that the Proof would be in the pudding, I guess, as an uh, expression that the, whether it sounds like you are open to experiments of political arrangements and coalitions among the, the secular and the religious to create forms of politics that are less oppressive. Um, and I mean, I guess I would say that, that, that that's something you find in, in many traditions, many Christian traditions. Um, so I, I do think it sounds like you're not saying there's an opposition between Christian faith and political power. We should just always be skeptical, suspicious, and um, concerned, I guess. Um, but it, it, uh, and it, and, and, and you do find value in the cultural vitality of different expressions of Christian faith. Um, so we don't leap out of our skins into some universal Christian identity. Um, but how that relates to nationalism, I still think is, is something that will be worked out in, in different ways, in different settings, um, given to different histories. So, the, the, but your answers all addressed um, the main questions I had. I mean, I guess maybe the, the one question I still have is whether or not, and this might be a, a kind of an American way of framing it, you favor the kind of personal care approach to social problems or the institutional structural care approach. So my students say, Professor Gregory, should I go work at a homeless shelter or go work for the federal government designing policy for homelessness? What would you tell an Orthodox Christian who asked you that in Serbia? I would tell them it's not a question either or, it's a question of both. Let's do both things. Let's try to change things where we can change them. Uh, if that involves a personal approach and doing something uh, within your own immediate uh, surrounding, uh, there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, you want to uh, try to change some governmental policies, uh, sure, why not? Like, I would add good luck with that, but, uh, but we should definitely try to do it. Uh, even, and, and I don't also accept those arguments that say, well, you know, it's an inconsistent position if you criticize corporations and what is now generally uh, known as corporate fascism, and then you work for a corporation. Like, it's an inconsistent position. Well, reality is much more complex than that. It doesn't need to be an inconsistent position if you're using your position within a corporation to actually do something against the corporate logic or bring a different kind of mindset within your immediate uh, surrounding uh, within which you work or uh, let alone change some of those corporate policies. 
So these things are, are complicated and that's where I don't really see the tension between these two things. Uh, I just want to point out that what we should refrain from is to give theological uh, justification to certain ideologies that once they are established as dominant ones, they have an oppressive potential. Uh, and that's what theologians or ideologists or intellectual class more generally has been doing since uh, whatever, cave time. <laughs> so that's, uh, and that's what we are mostly doing in, in all as intellectuals in, in different capacities. So yes, searching for concrete models that can address uh, the issues, immediate issues and change our societies, I don't see anything wrong about it on the contrary. But let us not confuse what is designed to change concrete realities with abstract concepts and search for ideal society uh, with, which will be justified by some uh, appeal to some metaphysical uh, narrative or metaphysical categories. So that's, that's where I see, so my answer to your question, whether uh, I see this imminent conflict between politics and Christianity, I do, and I explain in the book why, uh, but, but, but I, I don't mean by that that we should then stop having any connections or trying to change something or cooperate with political institutions because that's just this, uh, one may add, uh, fucked up reality in which we live and we need to live with that and deal with that. But democracy is not the kingdom of God, but it's better than corporate fascism. Uh, that, that's a very good summary. So a kind of democracy certainly is not the kingdom of God, and you know, it's not designed to be the kingdom of God, but a meaningful democracy would be a better idea, I think, than corporate fascism. The problem is that we are lacking meaningful democracy uh, in virtually any society on this planet and the situation is getting worse, so we better do something about it. Okay, now I'll address, I'll switch to certain so I can address uh, uh, Jovo's questions. Koje sam u među vremenu zaboravio, sve koje, koje sam teo i sve ono što, o čemu sam, uh, na što sam teo da reagujem, ali ima par stvari koje, koje se još sećam. Uh, prvo, hvala najprej za čitanje detaljne knjige, ali nisu baš moje pozicije u tvojoj interpretaciji bile korektno zastupljene ili korektno interpretirane. Najprej, ja nigde nisam sugerisao da mislim da nije moguće menjati realnost u ovom svetu. Naprotu, ima čitava sekcija u knjizi gdje ja govorim na koji način to moguće raditi. Uh, ono što, na što sam ja pokušao da ukažem i što sam kroz ove odgovore se negde uh, nazire, jeste povući razliku između toga iz koje perspektive gledamo i šta želimo da radimo. Dakle, teološke političke perspektive koja može da ima tu uh, bliskost koja se može okarakterisati kao jedna vrsta teološkog anarhizma, koji ipak ima prevashodno za cilj teološke motive i interesovanja, i onoga što je širi neki pristup anarhizmu kao političkoj filosofiji, koji opet može predlagati konkretne rešenje ili može zauzimati više negativan stav kritike. I ja bih se složio s tobom kad si rekao da levica, kad smatraš da levica je nešto što ima taj antropološki optimizam u sebi, oto da mi postaje krajnje nejasno sam taj antropološki pesimizam na kraju, Dakle, onda se posle pitanje šta tu podrazumevam kod levicom. Ja mislim da je upravo jedan od razloga zašto postoji bliskost ili bi trebalo da postoji bliskost između autentične levice koja je nešto veoma različito od liberalizma, jer liberalizam to nije leva opcija. To, mislim, o tome se ne zna puno i čak se u javnom diskursu govori neprekidno o tome liberalizam, levica, liberalizam je ideologija kapitalizma u suštini. I ona, dakle, nije, ona jeste napravila neke korake tamo negde sa lokom i drugima u svom kontekstu istorijskom i političkom i ona je dala 
neke ideje i teme za levicu koja se razvija kasnije kroz kraj 18. i 19. veku, ali dakle to nisu ne samo iste, nego su mnogi na mnogo načina suprostavljene ideologije. Ja mislim da levica i anarhizam kao možda najčišći vid levice upravo u tom antropološkom optimizmu i u skeptičnosti, što ja mislim da je odlika levice, treba da bude skeptičnost prema opresiji, da se tu nalazi sa ovim autentično hrišćanskim narativima. Ono što je još zanimljivo i to može biti pitanje iz tebe je jedna vrsta zaborava koju primećujemo i kod liberala, a i kod levičara, a to je zaborav samih religioznih ili sekularno religioznih korena tih ideologija. Nijedna od ideologija, uključujući ni levičare, ni bilo koje vrste, nisu pali s Marsa. One se razvije u svom istorijskom kontekstu i njihovi koreni su zapravo religiozni, ali nisu u najvećem broju slučajeva pravoslavni religiozni nego protestantski religiozni. I na kraju kraja, da nije bilo protestantizma, ne bi bilo ni liberalizma, a pitanje onda šta bi se dešavalo i sa socijalizmom. Tako da mislim da tu ima zaista prostora za jedan vrlo konstruktivan dijalog i za pisanje nekih novih istorija, jer su ove koje su već napisane u velikoj meri učinile konfuznu tu sliku i ispričale neke ideološke priče koje zapravo ne mogu u velikom broju slučajeva da se opravdaju onim što jesu neke istorije koje se dešavale i pogotovo ne onim kuda mi želimo da idemo kada recimo želimo da pravimo neko društvo koje će biti nešto slobodnije, koje će imati nešto veći, veće zastupljenje pravdu, ekonomsku jednakost i sve te stvari na kojima se levica i hrišćanstvo i pravoslavlje mogu naći i susresti bez bilo kakvih problema. Je imanentna teološka. Kao sociolog u velikoj meri smo mi saglasni. Dakle, ako čitate ovu knjigu vidjet ćete kritiku ne samo države, što je ključno mesto anarhizma, nego ćete vidjeti i kritiku korporacija, pominjao ih je Davor i sada, pa kritiku privatnih vojski, privatnih zatvora. Mi se vraćamo u neka stanja za koje smo mislili da su odavno ostavljena iza nas. A zapravo, ako posjedujete zatvor, vi ste moderni robovlasnik. To kaže Davor i ja sam potpuno saglasan sa njim. Sva ta, pazite, privatne vojske, to je postojalo negde u ranom modernom dobu. Sa državom to nestaje. I sad imate hibridna stanja, jačanje autoritarnih režima, dakle države, i istovremeno jačanje različitih privatnih zloupotreba moći na osnovu bogatstva. I tu su te dodirne tačke anarhizma i ja bih uvek naglasio rano hrišćanskog učenja, dakle, bogatstvo i moć rasteraju zločine. Namerno ne kažem greh, nego u zločine. I u tom smislu vi sad možete da kažete ovo ili ono, ali šta je današnji liberalizam, šta je današnja demokratija? Da li je to ideologija ljudskih prava? Pod čijom koprenom vi možete bombardovati koga hoćete. Pa to je. To je. Ili, ako pogledate sliku Sjedinih država, Davor navodi na jedno mesto američke pravoslavce. Ljudi koriste pravoslavnu teologiju da bi pravdali američki imperializam. Sve u nadi da će Sjedinje američke države postati pravoslavne. 
Pogledajte to. Dakle, čitava istorija pravoslavne teologije je istorija ideološkog pravdanja vlasti. I to ova knjiga dobro pokazuje. Druga je stvar što se Davor trudi da nađe izuzetke i da ih onda obrazloži ne bi li u tim izuzetcima našao neki temelj za optimizm. Problem je što su to izuzetci i zbog toga ja tu ne mogu da nađem optimizm. E sad, dakle, pazite, sebe samog definišem kao borbenog pesimista. Drugim rečima, učinit ću sve što mogu da praktičnim delanjem pokažem da nisam u pravu. Ne moramo se ti i ja takmičiti u pesimizmu, to se neće završiti dobro. Ali ono što mene zbunjuje u tom tvom komentaru je kao da, to je tačno što se rekao, postoji izuzetci, postoji dominantna mainstream narativ. Ali problem je što to niti je specifično pravoslavno, niti je specifično teološko, niti je specifično religijsko, to je tako u načelu. Jer isto tu stvar možeš da kažeš i za istoriju levičarskih ideja. Dakle, šta sad da radimo s tim? Pa upravo u tome i jeste poenta da pronađemo one momente gde se postoji suprostavljanje dominantno poredku moći, gde postoji težnja ka oslobođenju, ka konstruisanju nekih alternativnih ideja, ideologija, teologija, čega god hoćeš, teorija, i da onda na tome gradimo nešto što da time razumemo kontekst unutar koga funkcionišemo. Jer ništa nismo dobili time ako se samo ostanemo na nivou da se žalimo na ono što postoji kao dominantan mainstream. To je važno razumeti, važno razumeti kako to funkcioniše, ali da bi nešto bili sposobni da menjamo, moramo vidjeti kada su se, kako, pod kojim okolnostima javljale alternative i da tu alternativnu tradiciju onda uzmemo kao način iz koga prosto nešto možemo naučiti za kontekst koji živimo. Saglasan sto posto. Dakle, zato ovu knjigu i preporučujem. Ja ću je preporučiti i za prevod. Dakle, šta je važno? Videti šta su nam tačke oslonci. Problem je, međutim, na jednom mestu Davor piše hrišćanin je marginalac. Pazite, on ne misli na ove hrišćane kojih je puna crkva koji su došli da budu vidjeni, koji nisu došli zbog liturgijskog zajedništva u ljubavi, nego su došli da budu vidjeni. Nego on misli na prave hrišćane, kojih je uvek manjina. Oni su marginalci. I oni poredi sa intelektualcima, angažovanim intelektualcima, i disidentima. Dakle, to su manjine. Te manjine mogu, ako su dobro organizovane, što šta da promene u društvu. Problem je, međutim, što su zaista to marginalci, što vi nemate masovnu osnovu za društvene promene. I, naravno, Davor kaže, nije ovde reč samo o Srbi, nije ovde reč samo o pravoslavnom svetu, naravno, potpuno je u pravu, pa ono sporava doktrinu pravednog rata, A onda, razume se, tu je i sveti rat. Dakle, nijedan rat ne može biti pravedan. Zašto? Zato što urađa strahovitim patnjama, masovnim smrću. Prema tome, ako smo čoveko ljubivi, rat nije opravdan, bilo kakav. A s druge strane, opet, pa nekad se moraš braniti, što takođe on zna. Kao što vidite, stvari nisu ni malo jednostavne. I vrlo lako, naročito u kriznim vremenima, ideolozi će manipulacijom, demagogijom zavesti većinu ljudi. A kad se to desi, nažalost, Ja sam u svom životu, koji čak i nije toliko 
predugačak, nije do duše ni kratak. U prošlom veku ja bih bio više časna ili nečasna starina u ovim godinama, ali u ovom dobu se osjećam relativno mladim. Dakle, toliko sam video zavođenja ljudi koji su se prosto poveli za slatkorečivim demagozima. Za dve godine bit će vam bolje. Evo vidim, u Hrvatskoj već kopiraju. Kaže, za dve godine bit će vam plaća. Pogledajte kako se lako prenosi. Sve što će vas zavesti, u što ćete poverovati jer želite da verujete, to se lako prenosi. Nažalost, čovjek nije pretverano inteligentno biće. specifično jeste se razvoju najpoznatiji po tim imenom i vezano je za američki kontekst i američko pravoslavlje, ali nije isključivo vezano je za svako zanimljive religiozne figure koje su bile jako uticajne tamo sredinom i početnom drugih pomijenu 20. veka sa idejom tog radikalnog otklona od sveta i pre svega onoga što je podrazumevano pod materializmom savremene civilizacije. Problem sa tim je što uglavnom je u nekim svojim pojavnim oblicima to otišlo na stranu jednog fundamentalizma i jednog čak dualističkog pristupa svetu koji s pravom je onda osporavan kao nešto što nije baš jednostavno povezati sa pravoslavnim. Ali mislim priča je dugačka pa ovo je nekada. između ostalog tog pristupa i nije to sada moj originalni doprinos zato što se pojavilo dosta literature od te knjige koja je mnogo korigovala u nekim aspektima. Jedan, knjiga podeljena je, ja da i to kažemo, u dva dela. Prvi deo se tiče tih istorija dominantnog političkih teologija i vezane su za tu ideju simfonije uglavnom. Drugi deo je argument, moj argument iz teološke perspektive u prilog neke vrste anarhizma kao pravoslavne političke filosofije. U ovom prvom delu sam pokušao upravo da kažem šta je to što su bile dominantne političke teologije u tradiciji istočnog hrišćanstva, na koji način su one vezane sa onim što se dešavalo na zapadu i šta nije u redu sa tim narativima. Kako ih je moguće dekonstruisati? Jedna od tog važnih stvari je da je koncept simfonije suviše simplifikovan. On se koristi u javnom diskursu i u akademijskoj literaturi, ali vi kada pogledate malo bliže i probajte da razumete šta to znači u datom istorijskom kontekstu, vi nalazite tu gomilu nekakvih različitih modela koji se tako simplifikovano zovu simfonija, ali zapravo tu imate modele od onih pokušaja da se uspostavi autonomija između dve sfere i saradnja, do onih da crkva uđe u državu i da bude počinjena državi, 
do onih gde crkva pokušava da počini državu i državnu vlast sebi, koji su vrlo slični onome što na zapadu imamo, tih modela, te kooperativne razdvojenosti, jedne simbioze i tako daje. Tako da, ako hoćemo, ja pokušavam to isto da kažem da prosto koristi pojem simfonije nije korisno, jer taj pojem ne znači zapravo ništa. Ako ga proširimo da prosto on znači bilo koji odnos, da kažemo, harmoničan ili neka kohabitacija između crkve i države, pa onda ga možete slobodno primeniti na današnju Nemačku. U tom, onda, kada tako pristupite, onda neke velike razlike između Bizantije i savremenih nekih država nema. Dakle, moja poenta jeste da moramo biti mnogo ozbiljniji, mnogo precizniji kada govorimo i utemeniti to na, ako je moguće, nekim dokumentima. Imam još pitanje? Da, ja sam... To se već dešava. To se već dešava, svakako koristi bilo šta. Kada online radite, vrlo često dobijete reklame i sve drugo i pre nego što poželite nešto konkretno da kupite. Ali to je pitanje potpuno nas vodi u jednu drugu, isto tako važnu dimenziju, a to je uloga savjelnih tehnologija u kreiranju tih novih opresivnih sistema i ideologija. I to nije beznačajna priča, naprotiv, postaje sve aktualne. Mi već živimo u vremenu koje je na potpuno mnog način postavlja nas pred pitanje slobode i izazove sa kojima se suočavamo kada želimo da na smislen način govorimo i živimo slobodno kao građani, kao ljudska bića. I u tome već postoji dobra literatura, korisno je čitati. Ja, nažalost, primećujem da danas se redko šta bilo čita, bilo ko šta čita, pa jeste. I vi imate sada i profesor univerziteta koji u stvari ništa ne čitaju. Čitaju iz nekih skripti, da ne govorimo o drugima i gde je vrhunac, najveći deo populacije se naravno obrazuje, poznat smo navoda iz tabloida ili reality programa, društvenih mreža. Oni malo intelektualno osvojili preko YouTube-a, a oni baš vrhunski intelektualno osvojili preko nekih dokumentaraca. Ali zapravo čitanje zaista ozbiljne literature i razmišljanje je potpuno marginalizovano i to jeste još jedan element indoktrinacije. Jer ako odustanete od toga... Pa za mnoge ljude je već nepotrebno da razmišljaju, to i jeste problem. Ili da nakon se naše razmišljanje svi, nakon se će biti toliko sporo u prvom se razmišljanje i ajde, da će biti nepotrebno. Pa bit će deplasirano, kad to misli. Ali to i jeste taj problem, to je ono proročanstvo koje se samo ispunja. Dakle, mi živimo u svetu i mi sami sebi stavljamo neke ideološke modele koji nas onda dva koraka napred porobljavaju. I zato je potrebna ta kritička, kritički pristup i jedno ozbiljno bavljanje kritička refleksija kako ne bismo završili u jednoj formi totalitarizma koja bi prevazišla i zamijatina. A Orbeo smo već prevazišli. percepciju crkve ili 
prosto će oni biti u tom ključu prosto posmotreni kao neki izuzetci šta mi je ovo što njima pričamo jer na kraju kreva to nije dominantan trend pa kakve veze ima. Ili mislite da je prosto moguće? Ali to je pitanje funkcionisanja javne sfere uopšte. Zato što mi jedna od stvari koju primećujemo je zapravo kolaps javne sfere kao nečega autentično političkog. Vi danas nemate javnu sferu. Mi imamo jednu, prisutujemo jednu vrlo neobičnom, po prvi put inverziji, da ono što je po definiciji javno postaje privatno, to je rezno političko, tradicionalno je bilo sfera javnog, ona postaje privatizovana. Privatizuju privatni mediji, korporacije i tako dalje, ili na kraju krajeva pojedini lideri politički. A s druge strane, ono što je bila tradicionalno privatna sfera, ono što se dešava kod kuće, što radite u nekoj svojoj intimi, to postaje javno jer se sve vreme preko svih smart uređaja se vrši prisluškivanje, odnosno pravi se zabeleška toga šta su izgovorene stvari, sve te informacije koje opet služe korporativnom sektoru. I tu sada i onda nam društvene mreže koje to još eskaliraju. I tu je sad pitanje kako nešto učiniti u toj javnoj sferi, kako je nju moguće demokratizovati kako bismo ispunili sa nešto više, ne treba to biti sada nerealističan i veliki optimista da će to sad moguće sve jednostavno rešiti, ali kako je tu javnu sferu ispuniti za nijansu smislenim sadržajima koji će delovati subverzivno. Kako bi unutar te sfere bilo moguće otvoriti neka od ključnih pitanja. Ili pogledajte u savremene medije. Mi sve što slušamo na masovim medijima, mainstream medijima, pa i ovim naravnim tabloidima, to su sve potpuno besmislene te koje nemaju uopšte nikakav realan značaj. I sve priče koje se plasiraju, koje mi slušamo, koje se onda vrti, koje se kao znate javnost je sada fotusirana na taj i taj slučaj, pa na ovaj i na onaj, to su generisane, to je dakle marketinjski trik kojima se sve realne stvari, probleme drže na margini i van u stvari javnog fokusa i javne diskusije. I onda dolazim do ovog pitanja kako se pojednostavljaju stvari, kako u stvari imamo stereotipe, imamo ih i naravno intelektualci su tu takođe odgovorni za to, zato što su oni ti koji veoma često daju te idejne okvire unutar koga se onda realnost hvata u te ideološke mreže. Dakle, mislim da je tu problem naravno i školstva, obrazovanja, medijske sfere, ima puno toga da se uradi ko hoće da radi, jer sad ovi egzistencijalni pesimisti poput Jove i mene možemo imati tu rezerve, ali svakako i pored rezervi u nekom apsolutnom smislu je potrebno raditi konkretno, jer uvek treba se setiti i citirati Gramšija o zadržavanju pesimizma intelekta i zadržavanju optimizma volje. Dakle, čak i moja pozicija i kada nam se čini racionalno da je sve to otišlo u gde već, i da nema nikakve šanse da se bilo šta popravi, da i u toj situaciji ima smisla raditi na popravljanju, jer mi nikada ne možemo u potpunosti znati i videti sve moguće faktore i nikada ne znate da li, ako verujete u ljudsku slobodu, da li će neka aktivnost koja se sada dešava na ovom kraju sveta, nešto što radi ovi ljudi, imati nekog dalekosežnog efekta. Dakle, pesimizam intelekta, racionalno analizirati ne, zaletati se u neke nerealne i suviše optimistične projekte, ali optimizam volje da ne treba nikad posustati kada deluje najbeznadežnije, ima se smisla boriti i u tom smislu ti si ovo opet i svojim političkim angažmanom sebe demantovao, tako da daješ jedan od dobrih primjera kako se može izaći iz... Ne, 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 ali izaći iz jednog konfora u jednu arenu, da li to onda uspešno, neuspešno, ali kada se, dakle, dati neki doprinos i na kraju krajeva izvući neke lekcije iz toga i onda ići dalje. Ja mislim, što ovo ću reći da završimo, ali ako nekako još neki pitanje može, Možemo da vas lako da nemate pitanja, tako da je to u redu. Hvala još jednom svima, hvala učesnicima i do nekog sledećeg videa.